Learning how to cut threads in the lathe can be quite a daunting prospect. It's high time I brushed up on my threading skills, so I thought I'd take you guys on that journey with me. In today's video, we're gonna be learning four different methods for cutting single point threads on the lathe, and then we're gonna apply these methods to cut both internal and external left and right-handed threads. Let's start by understanding a little bit about how screw threads are formed. This is a threading tool and it has a 60 degree profile, which is what we need for the most common metric and imperial threads. It's a form tool, so the shape that you see here is what we'll end up with in the workpiece when we plunge the tool in. Now that we know we can cut a decent profile, we need to find a way to couple the spindle and the carriage. This will allow the tool to translate along the workpiece as the workpiece is rotating, resulting in a helix. This is a lead screw, and this is what's gonna pull the carriage and therefore the cutting tool along the workpiece. You'll generally find it at the front of the machine, although this one is mostly obscured by the cover. It's a little bit easier to see on my mini lathe. This is a pair of half nuts. They're attached to the carriage and are operated by a lever on the front of the apron. And once engaged with the lead screw, they pull the carriage along at a fixed rate. That fixed rate is determined by two factors. Number one, the pitch of your lead screw, and number two, the gear ratio coupling the spindle to the lead screw. And it's the combination of those two things that determine the pitch of the thread that we're gonna cut into our workpiece. The spindle and lead screw are coupled together by a train of gears known as change gears. As you can see on my lathe here, the input and output gears are exactly the same size, giving us a ratio of one to one, i.e. one rotation of the spindle equals one rotation of the lead screw. I actually have a thread cutting gearbox on this lathe, but let's for a moment forget that I've got that and that the spindle and the lead screw are coupled directly together like they are on this mini lathe. Let's say for argument's sake that I'm running a metric lead screw with a pitch of 2.5 millimeters. Given our one to one ratio between the spindle and the lead screw, when we engage the half nuts, we're essentially gonna be copying exactly the pitch of the lead screw. So we'll end up cutting a thread of 2.5 millimeters. If we want to cut a different thread pitch, then we need to change that gear ratio. If we swap to two to one, i.e. one revolution of the spindle for every two revolutions of the lead screw, the tool will be traversing the work at twice the speed and we'll end up with a pitch twice as coarse, i.e. five millimeters in this case. By the same logic, if we gear the lead screw to run at half the speed of the spindle, we'll get a much finer pitch, in this case 1.25 millimeters. So hopefully it's now clear that we can achieve pretty much any thread pitch that we want given the right gear ratio. We can even cut imperial threads with a metric lead screw and vice versa, and we'll be talking more about that later in the video. Before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about how we actually configure these gear ratios to cut the pitches that we want. On this mini lathe, we've got a driving pinion and then we've got six gears, A, B, C, D, E, and F. They're laid out in a compound train and they mesh together as per the diagram. So it's as simple as looking at the chart, either the metric or the imperial one, working out what thread pitch you want to cut and then selecting the appropriate sized gear wheels and installing them in the correct places in the gear train. This is all quite simple to do, but it is a bit time consuming because every time you want to switch between thread pitches, you have to change all the gears. On my bigger lathe, I have a gearbox, which is a lot more convenient. I still have to change uh, the change wheels when moving from feeds and speeds to metric threads, for instance, or from metric threads to imperial threads. But once I've done that, if I want to change between thread pitches, it's just a question of throwing a few levers. So time now to start cutting our first thread and I'm going to be doing an M10 by 1.5. I'm not going to be cutting it in steel. I'm going to be doing it in brass because it's a lot more forgiving. <laughs> 
This is the first of our methods and I'm going to call this one the plunge. The idea is that we plunge our tool into the work at 90 degrees, then traverse the tool to cut the thread and then retract the tool using the cross slide. One of the good things about this method is that it's easy to execute and easy to remember. One of the bad things is that the tool pressure is quite high. Because we're plunging that tool in at 90 degrees to the work, uh, it's cutting on both sides at the same time and this can lead to chip jamming and chatter and poor surface finish. So let's move on to prepping our stock. The first thing we need to do is to reduce the size of our stock to the nominal major diameter of the thread, which in this case is 10 millimeters. Although it is often easier to go slightly under this for reasons that I'll explain later on. So in this case, I'm going to reduce the size of this stock to 9.8 millimeters. I'm then going to machine a thread relief and a generous chamfer. And that is our stock prepared and ready for threading. And I now need to set my lathe gearbox to uh, the correct thread pitch. I've installed the change wheels that we need to cut metric threads and I'm looking for a thread pitch of 1.5 millimeters. So I need to set my gearbox uh, levers and knobs to AC and LT in this case, according to the table. If you don't have a gearbox on your lathe, you'll need to refer to your lathe instructions and work out which change wheels you need to change in order to cut the correct thread pitch. It's always a good idea to blow up the workpiece when you're threading so that it's easier to see where you're cutting and what you're doing. Now we're almost ready to start cutting some threads, but before we do that, we need to zero out our dials so that we can keep an eye on the depth of cut. And the way that that is done is that we very slowly wind our tool in until it just makes contact with the workpiece and we get a very light scratch on the surface. And at this point we can set the cross slide hand wheel indicator to zero because this is going to be what we're going to be using to control our depth of cut using this method. We can then retract the tool using the cross slide, move the uh, carriage along out of the way of the workpiece and then move the tool back into zero on the cross slide so that we're ready to start our threading operation. Before we do our first pass we do need to mention the threading dial. As we'll be doing many passes, we need to engage and disengage the lead screw uh, many times. And if we don't re-engage it at the correct point, we're gonna end up with a crossed thread. The threading dial allows us to select the safe points that we can re-engage the lead screw. And these are gonna be different for each thread pitch that we want to cut. I have this chart attached to my machine. And as you can see from here, the 1.5 millimeter thread pitch, I can engage on one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. 11. So as long as we engage on any of those numbers, we should be fine. So with our machine running, we keep an eye on that threading dial. When our number comes round, in this case number seven, we engage the half nuts and the carriage starts moving. This first pass is known as the scratch pass and it's made at almost a zero depth of cut so that we can check with our thread pitch gauge and make any corrections if necessary. And when we get to the end of the thread, we disengage the half nut so we don't crash into that shoulder. We can then retract the tool, wind the carriage back to the start of the thread, and then wind the carriage back in to take our next cut. As we're advancing for the next cut, I would take into consideration that we are just plunging straight into the material here. Therefore, that tool is cutting on both sides and the tool pressure is gonna be um, reasonably high. So um, I'm gonna be uh, restricting myself to kind of 0.1 of a millimeter for each of the uh, passes here. And then it's just rinse and repeat, uh, taking off a little more each pass until it starts looking like a thread. So we've got a nice thread forming there. We've still got some nice flat crests on the top of the threads, as you can see by the blue bits. Um, so now it's time to start trying our nut for fit. And that doesn't quite want to start. So uh, we're going to need to take another couple of passes. Now I got a bit greedy with that last cut there, uh, went a bit too deep and uh, I've thinned out those crests a little bit more than I would have liked and I've introduced some chatter marks to the thread. 
but the nut fits and it's a functional thread, so I'm happy. Now I'm really starting to enjoy this threading lark, so I'm gonna try and up the ante. I'm gonna create a bigger diameter thread with a coarser pitch using a more advanced technique. And to do that, we're gonna be using this inch and a half hexagon brass bar. I've chosen a thread size of M22 by 2.5. And because I don't yet have a nut that big to check the fit, I'll be making this later, I'm gonna to need to hit some specific dimensions. I got these numbers from the machinery's handbook. The numbers given are for a specific diameter, thread pitch, and class of fit. And we're given minimum and maximum for the minor diameter, the pitch diameter, and the major diameter. The major diameter is the largest diameter in our thread and is measured across the peaks of our threads. The minor diameter would be the smallest diameter measured if we were to measure across the valleys of the threads. And the pitch diameter is an imaginary line that goes somewhere in between where the distance across a thread is exactly the same as the distance across the gap between threads, i.e. half the pitch. I've set my target dimensions to be in the middle of these uh, minimum and maximum values so that we could be somewhere in the middle of the, uh, the tolerance for the thread. One thing to note here is that the major diameter that I'm shooting for is 21.83 and not 22 millimetres. And the reason for that is that we want to get some clearance between the peaks and the troughs of our thread, otherwise it's going to bind up. So I'm going to start reducing the size of this bar down to 21.83 millimetres, which is the major diameter that we're shooting for on this thread. And two hundredths of a millimetre is close enough for what we're doing here. I'll cut a thread relief and a chamfer and then we're ready to blue the part up. For this thread, we're looking for a pitch of 2.5 millimeters, so I'll select the correct gears on my gearbox. For method two, we're gonna be using the compound slide turned round at just under 30 degrees so that as the tool is advanced into the work, it cuts on only one of its faces, therefore reducing tool pressure. This in theory should improve surface finish and also help us when cutting harder materials. For this method, we are required to move the compound slide round to slightly less than half the included angle of the threading tool that we're using. Our thread is 60 degrees, so we're going for 29.5 degrees. One thing to note is on some import lathes like mine, the scale is engraved in a different orientation. So you actually have to set the compound to 59 degrees on my lathe rather than 29.5. If in doubt, use a protractor. We set up a dial indicator on the uh, tool post there so that we can measure our depth of cut. You can't use the hand wheels on the compound slide to measure the depth of cut because you will get a cosine error because it's going in at an angle. Now we touch off on the work as usual before setting the uh, hand wheel dials to zero and also zeroing out the indicator we have on the compound. And then we're ready for our scratch pass. It was about now that I started thinking that thread pitch looks much finer than I was expecting. And yes, a quick check with the pitch cage confirms that something's not quite right. And I quickly realised that uh, although I'd thrown all the right levers and got all the right settings for the pitch that I wanted, I'd not actually installed the correct change gears. So I fixed that and then it was time to re-blue the part and try again. And it looks like now we're on the right track. So our process here starts with winding the cross slide back into our zero mark, applying some depth of cut with the compound slide, starting the machine, waiting for our number to come round on the threading dial, engaging the half nut, and making the cut. Then we disengage the half nut, retract the tool using the cross slide, Wind the carriage back to the start of the cut. Wind the cross slide back to zero. Add some more depth of cut with the uh, compound slide and then we're ready to take a next cut. And then it's just a question of repeating those actions over and over until we get close to our final size. 
I'm getting close to size now, so I'm gonna start measuring the threads on each pass. I'm using a thread micrometer here. These measure the thread pitch diameter directly, so it's a really convenient way of measuring the threads, although these are quite expensive. A more economical way to measure threads in the home workshop is to use thread wires. They can be quite uh, inexpensive, but they are a bit fiddly to use. It's a good idea to reduce the depth of cut for the last few passes, and even to do some spring passes to improve the surface finish of the threads. I was shooting for 20.28 on our pitch diameter there to be right in the middle of the tolerances. I've actually landed on 20.31 and a little bit, so I think that's going to be just fine for what we're doing here. Overall, I'm really pleased with the way these threads have come out. I should have cut the uh, thread relief a little bit deeper and there is a little bit of damage on the first thread. Stupidly, I was a little bit too quick on the uh, lead screw on one of the passes and I engaged it on the wrong number and it started to cross thread. Luckily, I managed to catch it almost immediately and I don't think too much damage is done. Uh, if this causes a problem later on, I can just come in and re for this part and take the first bit of that thread off. I'm really pleased with the surface finish on the threads. Um, I took some really light cuts and some spring passes on the final runs there, and that seems to have done me uh, a good turn. Now, it's my plan to turn this bar into a fidget toy. So I'm gonna turn this bar around in the lathe and cut an identical but left-handed thread on the other end. Now, in order to cut left-hand threads, we need to make one important change to our setup, and that is to reverse the direction of the lead screw. Now you might think that putting the lathe in reverse would achieve this, but it's not that simple. During normal operation and right-handed thread cutting, both the spindle and the lead screw turn in the same direction, i.e. counterclockwise. Now to cut left-hand threads, we need to maintain that counterclockwise direction on the spindle, but we need the lead screw to be rotating in the opposite direction. Now to set this up on my lathe is a piece of cake, you simply throw this lever. And now you can see that the spindle and the lead screw are turning in opposite directions. Now, if you've got a lathe like my mini lathe here that doesn't have one of those levers that allows you to switch the direction of the lead screw, I think the only way to do it is to add an extra idler gear into the gear train. This would mean modifying the banjo arrangement to allow space for an extra axle for that idler gear, but it would let you reverse the lead screw direction with respect to the spindle, allowing you to cut left-hand threads. If you know of any other ways to cut left-hand threads in a mini lathe, please do let me know in the comments. I'd be really interested to hear. I'm going to prep the other side of our bar in exactly the same way as I did the first side. Now, we'll be cutting our left-hand thread with exactly the same methods and procedures as our right-hand thread, with one interesting difference. Because the lead screw is now rotating in the opposite direction, the cutting tool also moves in the opposite direction. Therefore, we'll be cutting away from the headstock rather than towards it. 
And that thread came out even better than the last one, actually. No mistakes this time, and I'm really pleased. And now it's time to make the matching left-handed and right-handed nuts. I've sawn and faced both sides of the bar stock to a thickness of 20 millimeters, and I'm now gonna chamfer the edge just to make it look nice. I then need to drill and bore the through hole to the correct size. I'm shooting for a major diameter of 22.29 on this, which should give us a nice fit with the threads we've already cut. I'll create a generous chamfer to give us a nice lead in for our thread and then blew the internal bore ready for our scratch pass. We're using an internal threading tool rather than an external threading tool here for obvious reasons. Uh, the profile of the cutter is exactly the same, it's just oriented differently. We'll be using method two for this, i.e. the compound method, and the order of operations is almost identical to the external threading operation. We start by zeroing out our cross slide, and then we shall apply some depth of cut with the compound. And this is the only place where the method differs because we have to wind the compound in rather than winding it out because we're cutting an internal thread rather than an external. We watch for our number to come round on the threading dial, engage our half nut, make the cut, And then once the cutter is clear of the work on the backside, we disengage the half nut, wind the cross slide out so the tool is clear of the work, roll the carriage back to the start of the cut, move the cross slide back to zero, and wind on some more cut with the compound. And we're ready for our next cut. And it's about time for our first test fit. Hang on a minute. I am such an idiot. Do you remember this? When I cut that ID, I cut it to the major diameter and not the minor diameter. So it's way too big and this part is scrap. Still, you live and learn and there's only one thing for it and that's to remake the part. And this time we've nailed it. Those threads could do with a little bit of cleanup, but otherwise it's come out really well. And to finish up, I just need to flip it round and chamfer the other side. Next, I'm gonna make the nut for the left-hand thread. And this is made in exactly the same way as the last one, except for the fact that we've reversed the lead screw and we're now threading away from the headstock. Time for a test fit. Obviously this being a left-handed thread, we have to screw it the opposite way to what we're used to. And that seems like a great fit. 
I think that nut came out better than the last one. I made some nuts for the end of the fidget toy and these have got blind holes. The one with the left-handed thread was made in the same way as the other left-handed thread nuts. But the right-handed nut was made with method 3 which I shall talk about in a minute. To finish up this fidget toy I'd like to do some engraving. And that gives me the perfect opportunity to give you a sneak peek of my new favourite tool. Which is this 20 watt fibre laser. Having the ability to accurately engrave metal in the workshop here is really going to open up a lot of doors to projects that I couldn't have previously uh, attempted. So in my next video, we're going to thoroughly explore what this uh, machine is capable of and see what we can make with it. Do hit that subscribe button if you'd like to catch that. And if you'd like to learn more about this machine or where you can get one from, I'll leave a link in the description. And that is our fidget toy finished. Now that we're done with our fidget toy, we can move on to method three for cutting right hand threads. Now it might have occurred to you that uh, working close to the chuck or working close to a shoulder can be quite stressful when threading. If we don't get that tool disengaged just at the right moment, we can crash the tool into the work, destroying both the work and the tool and maybe even damaging the lathe. This is especially pertinent when cutting threads into blind holes. Now there's a much less stressful way of threading and that's threading away from the headstock. Now you'll notice if I stop the lathe and put it in reverse and then engage the lead screw, the cutting tool moves away from the headstock. Now I know you've seen me cutting away from the headstock earlier in the video, but that was for left hand threads. This is for right hand threads. Now there is one quirk with this method. As the workpiece is now turning the other way, we need to turn the cutting tool upside down. And we'll also need to reset the tool on center height. Now this method is very similar to the other methods. Uh, we can still use the compound for setting our cuts. We're engaging and disengaging the lead screw as normal using the threading dial. And one big advantage with this method is that we can actually run the lathe faster because we're not worried about crashing into anything at the end of the cut. This can be really useful when cutting things like steel where we actually need a, a slightly faster cut to improve the surface finish. One thing to bear in mind for those of you that have got screw on chucks, this might not be the method for you because there's a good chance you might unscrew your chuck whilst threading using this method because the lathe is running in reverse. Now I think that's a reasonable looking thread. We do have some light chatter marks. I could have taken some lighter cuts with that. Um, if I'd have taken another couple of spring passes, that would have uh, cleaned up nicely and give us a better finish, I think. Also running the lathe quicker would have helped with that. This is just mild steel. A great use case for this method is cutting internal threads into a blind bore. I've already spoken about cutting left hand threads with this method. But the right hand thread is gonna cause us a bit of an issue when we're running the lathe in reverse like this because we can't use the same tool. This is our regular right-handed internal threading tool. And this one is a left-handed internal threading tool. Confusing, I know, using a left-handed threading tool to create a right-handed thread, but remember we are running the lathe in reverse and cutting on the opposite side. So that leads us nicely on to the fourth and final screw cutting method that we're going to learn today. I found a chunk of three and a half inch round brass bar and thought that would be an ideal opportunity to demonstrate cutting imperial threads with a metric lead screw. I've swapped out my change gears so I can run imperial threads. The most important gear here is the 127 tooth gear which gives us the uh, conversion between metric and imperial. I've prepped my brass bar and I figured we'd do a rather odd ball thread. We're gonna do three and a half inches by 11 TPI for no other reason really that it, I thought it'd be nice to see that you can actually cut pretty much any thread pitch or diameter that you like in the home workshop given the right gear ratios. So method four. What we're gonna do here is essentially do away with the thread dial. We're gonna do away with engaging and disengaging the lead screw. We're gonna engage the lead screw once and we're gonna leave it engaged until the cut is finished. As far as I'm aware, if we're cutting imperial threads with a metric lead screw, or we're cutting metric threads with an imperial lead screw, this is the only way to go. Because of that conversion between the two, if we disengage our lead screw at any time, we're gonna ruin our thread. 
So the order of operations here is to start the lathe, engage the lead screw, make the cut, and then leaving the lead screw engaged, you need to turn the lathe off and let it run down to a stop. Hopefully before it either crashes into the end of the workpiece or into the chuck itself. This can be a bit nerve wracking to say the least. Because the whole system has inertia, you have to kind of judge uh, where it's actually gonna finally come to rest. Next, you need to back the tool out and then put the lathe into reverse to bring the tool back up to the start of the cut. Before dialing in your next cut and starting the process all over again. If you do need to use this method, then combining it with the last method, i.e. cutting away from the headstock, is probably advisable. It's certainly going to be a lot less stressful. I did several spring passes on this thread as it still seemed to be removing material on each pass and I think it really paid dividends because the threads came out absolutely beautifully. All they needed was a quick buff with some scotch bright to knock down some of those small burrs. So I've really enjoyed this journey into thread cutting and I thought we'd just summarise quickly what we've learned today. We've learned four different methods for cutting threads on the lathe. That's the plunge, the compound, the cutting away from the headstock and the always engaged lead screw method. We've learned how to cut external threads, internal threads, right-handed threads and left-handed threads. And we've also learned how to cut metric threads on an imperial lead screw and imperial threads on a metric lead screw. If you've got any questions on anything that you've seen here today, please let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to respond. If you've enjoyed this video today, I'd really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and maybe even check out my Patreon using the link below. Many thanks and I'll see you on the next one.